So I've always thought that the the shortcut or the way to uh, to learn how to use commas and to have much better punctuation in general is to be able to identify the parts of a sentence, the, the different building blocks. So that's what we're going to start with. A phrase. You've heard it. You've heard it. Pat Sajak. It's a phrase. Whatever. You've heard it many, t- many times, but what does it mean? It means a group of words without a subject or a verb that cannot stand alone as a complete thought. Great. The, really, the number one type of phrase is a prepositional phrase, and that's really the only one you'll have cause to deal with. The next part... Okay, so I have a... I have a uh, an example here. So you can see there, a prepositional phrase is right here, around the side, that's the first one, okay, of the house, second one, on the porch. So there are three prepositional phrases starting off this sentence. Around the side, of the house, on the porch. Those are all prepositional phrases. There are three of them. All right. Great, fine, wonderful. What is a clause? A clause is a group of words that has a subject and a verb, period. But what is an independent clause? It is a group of words that has a subject and a verb and can can stand alone as a complete thought. Now let's talk about this complete thought business for a second because it becomes very important. A complete thought, what is it? If you walked up to someone in the hallway and said, uh, although I got into the shower with my socks on this morning, <laughs> and yeah, that's weird, and then just walked off. Although I got into the shower with my socks on this morning and just walked off. It's not a complete thought. Those people are going to think you are crazy. Number one, what are you doing getting in the shower with your socks on? That's weird. It's, it's weird. It's weird. Number two, it's not a complete... You, you, you come up and tell me something about getting in the shower with your socks on, and then you leave me hanging? That's a double win. That, you know, you just, man. Okay. That is not a complete thought. Now, if you were to just walk up to someone and say, I got into the shower with my socks on this morning. That is a complete thought. But when you put that word although in front of it, it necessarily needs more to complete the thought. Right? Okay, here we go. An independent clause is a group of words, a group of words with a subject and a verb that can stand alone as a complete thought. Hey, man, Joe hit the ball. Check it, check it, check it, check it. We have Joe, subject. Joe's the subject. We have hit, that is the verb, and then we have ball, that's the direct object. Great, that's a complete sentence. Joe hit the ball, wonderful, great. We are so happy with ourselves. Now, a dependent clause, otherwise known as subordinate clause. Subordinate means something is over you, something is in charge of you. If you have a boss at work, you are her subordinate. So a subordinate clause is a dependent clause. Just key in on that word dependent. Dependent, a group of words with a subject and a verb that cannot stand alone as a complete thought. Let's see what I have here. Ooh, okay. Although, you can see down here, although... Although storm clouds were approaching the stadium, Joe hit the ball. Great! Wonderful! You cannot walk up to someone in the hallway and say, Although storm clouds were approaching the stadium, and walk away. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. It's, you should try it. I mean, I, Although storm clouds were approaching the stadium is the dependent clause. You say, oh, what's a clause then? Oh, a clause is a group of words with a subject and a verb. Okay, well, where's the subject and where's the verb? Hmm, although storm clouds were approaching. Hey, look, clouds 
is the subject. We're approaching is the verb. So we have a subject and a verb, but it can't stand alone as a, as a, as a complete thought. Indeed. So this is a dependent clause right here. The first part, it's in reddish brick red or whatever. And then this is an independent clause. Independent clause, dependent clause. Independent clause, dependent clause. Good, great, wonderful. Moving on. Now, now that we have that, here are the different sentence types. There are four. There are only four types of sentences. Simple, complex, compound, and compound complex. A simple sentence is a, is, has one independent clause. But do not be fooled. Some simple sentences are long and complex. Just because it only has one independent clause doesn't mean that it has to be tiny like cats hunt mice, right? It can be a very long, just ask Ernie Heming, Ernest Hemingway is famous for the 25 word simple sentence, you know. So nonetheless, here we go. We have, we have our, our, uh, our examples here. Cats hunt mice. Full, full, complete thought? Yes. Walk up to anyone in the hall and say that and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. They'll think you're weird. Jamie is beautiful. I put that there because this is what's called a linking verb. It links the subject of the sentence to the predicate. In this case, it's a predicate adjective. But Jamie is beautiful. Full sentence, full stop, boom. That's an independent clause. I see there. Joe hit the ball and ran the bases. Uh-oh. All right. Uh-oh. Now, check it. Check it, check it, check it, check it. Joe hit the ball. We already covered that. That is a full sentence. It's an independent clause. How about Anne ran the bases? Isn't that another independent clause? No, because what is it lacking? It is lacking a second subject. It's lacking a sec second subject. Now look down here. Joe hit the ball and he ran the bases. That has two independent clauses. Joe hit the ball is one, and he ran the bases is the second one. But Joe hit the ball and ran the bases. You can't walk up to someone in the hallway and say, ran the bases. No. So that makes it a compound predicate, not, not a second independent clause. Great, wonderful, oh, wonderful. What do you, I thought you were gonna talk about commas. Shauna felt good grief. Okay, I will. I will. Complex sentence has one independent clause and at least one dependent clause. Let's look at one. Billy hit the ball because he is a star athlete. Check it out. This is the dependent portion right here. Billy hit the ball because he is a star athlete. You can't walk up to someone in the hall and say because. Because he's a star, star athlete, no. Now we reverse it on the next one. Because he is a star athlete, comma, Billy hit the ball. Great, fine. That is the dependent clause portion of that sentence, and this is the dependent clause portion of this sentence. It's just kind of reversed. That makes this a complex sentence because it has a dependent clause and an independent clause. He is a star athlete is the independent clause. The, the uh, I'm sorry, uh, Billy hit the ball is the independent clause because he is a star athlete is the dependent portion. Although storm clouds were approaching the stadium, Joe hit the ball. We covered this one. It's a complex sentence because it has one independent clause, Joe hit the ball, and one dependent clause, although storm cl crowds were approaching the stadium. Good. Now, a compound sentence is just what it sounds like. It is two or more independent clauses put together in one sentence. Now, notice up here I have DCIC. So that's dependent clause, independent clause, at least one dependent clause. There can be many dependent clauses, but that, that is the makings of a complex sentence. But a compound sentence has 
an independent two at least two independent clauses. There could be five hundred independent clauses in there, whatever, but it has to have at least two. And keep in mind, a compound sentence has no dependent clauses, none. Let's look at some. The police arrived. That's the first independent clause. Walk up to someone in the hallway and say the police arrived, and they're going to run. <laughs> They'll know what you're talking about. It's not. It's not a fragment. It's not a, a phrase. It is an independent clause. It stands alone as a complete thought. How about the next part? The police arrived. We were still frightened. Yes, indeed. So you have two. You have two independent clauses. Right. Good. How about this next one? Joe hit the ball and he ran the bases. We covered that just a second ago. Independent clause, independent clause. Good. Now I want you to know that there are but two ways in the entire universe. There are two ways to combine independent clauses into one sentence. Two. But two. And that's it. With a comma and a coordinating conjunction or with a semicolon. People hate semicolons. Ha semicolons have the worst reputation ever. I, I urge you not to use them. They're just, I don't know. There's no rhyme or reason for it, but English professors, English teachers in general, frown upon them. Nonetheless, this is correct. Joe hit the ball semicolon. He ran the bases. That's a perfectly good sentence, uh, independent clause on both sides of the uh, semicolon, which is required. Now, compound complex to end it. Compound complex is a variety of all of the above. It has at least two independent clauses and at least one dependent clause. Although the police had arrived, here's the dependent portion, Although the police had arrived, that's the first dependent clause, okay? Although the police had arrived, you can't walk up to someone in the hallway and say, although the police had arrived, they need more. They need more. Although the police had arrived, that is the dependent clause portion, we thought the burglars may still be in the house. Complete sentence. We thought the burglars may still be in the house. We thought they were there. That's the first independent clause. And then the second independent clause is, so we were frightened. So you have, you have three portions here. You have a dependent clause and two independent clauses all put together in one sentence. That is a compound complex sentence. Right, great. And so here are some basic sentence patterns. So we have sentence types, simple compound, compound, complex. But these are sentence patterns. They're basically the templates uh, that sentences are uh, kind of the template for making different types of sentences. So let's start here. You have, uh, you have subject VI. Now what does that VI stand for? It stands for intransitive verb. And what is an intransitive verb? It is a verb that does not have a direct object. So then that must mean that a verb that does have a direct object is a transitive verb. Yes, transitive verb has a direct object. Intransitive verb does not have a direct object. Okay, so let's go with this subject intransitive verb. Okay, check it out. We've got, we've got Billy and Billy ran. Billy ran. Billy's the subject. Ran is the intransitive verb. There is no direct object. There is no direct object. The next one is dogs hunt. Dogs is the subject and hunt is the intransitive verb. Okay, the next sentence pattern is subject, transitive verb, direct object. Now what the heck is a direct object? All right, so direct object is the thing that receives the action of the verb. Billy hit. 
What did he hit? He hit the ball. So in this case, the ball right here is the direct object. Billy is the subject, hit is the transitive verb, and ball is the direct object. All right, dogs hunt squirrels. Dogs hunt squirrels. Dogs is the uh, subject, hunt is the transitive verb, and squirrels is the direct object. Do you see how the ball receives the, the hit, the action, the hitting? The squirrels receive the action, the hunt, they are hunted. Okay, great. So we have subject, intransitive verb for our first sentence pattern. Subject, transitive verb, direct object for our second. Now for the third, we have subject, linking verb, VL, linking verb. Subject, linking verb, and either a predicate nominative or a predicate adjective. Uh, these together, these two things together are called the subject complement. I want you to think of this, like a linking verb l literally links the subject to the predicate. Uh, so, Joe is cool. That means Joe equals cool. Joe and cool are, are, are held in a, in a uh, uh, equal relationship here. Joe is cool. So you can almost think of these linking verbs like equal signs. So you can, the subject can, can either equal one of two things. It can either equal a noun, a thing, or an adjective, a, a, uh, a, 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 state, a status. So the room fell silent. Now I put this in here because fell, people generally wouldn't think that that is a linking verb, but certainly the room fell silent. You could say the room was silent or the room is silent, same thing. The room fell silent. So here we have room. Here we have room is the subject, okay? Fell is the linking verb and silent is Silent is an adjective. It describes the condition of something. So, the room fell silent. That is a predicate adjective. Predicate adjective. Yeah, so here we have, in this one, we have the subject, linking verb, predicate adjective. In the next one, he became a boxer. He is the subject, became is the linking verb, and a boxer is the predicate noun. So you have, you have two different versions here. You have subject linking verb predicate noun and subject linking verb predicate adjective here. All right, great. And these two things together, the predicate noun and predicate adjective taken together are the subject complement. It complements the subject. Now, the, this, next, this next pattern, subject, transitive verb, indirect object, direct object. All right, now that's too many for me. What is a direct object, indirect object? Funny you should ask. An indirect object is a noun phrase referring to someone or something that is affected by the action of a transitive verb, typically a recipient. Typically, it's receiving but it's not, it's not the primary object. It often receives the action of the object. So you have the, ver, the, the, the subject, the subject does, performs the action described by the verb. The direct object receives the action and the indirect object oftentimes receives action from the direct object, all right? So let's look at one. Mary brought him an apple. Mary is the subject. Mary is the subject. Brought is the transitive verb. What did Mary bring? Did, did Mary bring him or did she bring an apple? Okay, she brought the apple. So that must mean that apple is a direct object and him is the indirect object. Can you see how can you see how a him received the apple? So it's like it's receiving action almost at second hand. Okay, good. 
And then the next one, John, subject, read his nephew a story. Read would be the tra uh, transitive verb. And then what did he read? Did he read his nephew? No, he read a story. So the story is the direct object. And then the indirect object is nephew. So John read to his nephew. So it's sort of secondhand re receiving of the action. Okay, now final one for, for this time. We have subject, transitive verb, direct object, object complement. Okay, this is one of the, this is much like the predicate adjective and predicate nominative or predicate noun. It's either a noun or an adjective, this object complement. The object complement is a noun, pronoun, or adjective, adjective that follows a direct object to rename it or state what it has become. I consider the issue dead. I consider. I is the subject. Consider is the transitive verb. What are you considering? Dead? No, I'm considering the issue. So that is the direct object. And then the object complement renames that object. What is, what is it about the issue? It's dead. So that is the object complement. In this case, it is an adjective. It's a descriptor. In the next example, there is a noun for the object complement. We is the subject. Elected is the transitive verb. Jenny. We elected Jenny. We elected Jenny. Jenny is the direct object. The election is the action. Jenny receives the action. She is elected. And then, what, but wait, what did you elect her? President. President. So this is the object complement, and it is a noun. Yes, indeed. There are more uh, sentence patterns than just these, but, uh, but these are the primary ones that you will see over and over and over and over again. Now you can combine these with different types of, uh, different types of sentences in the way of uh, compound complex, compound. You can put, uh, you can put, um, you can put uh, introductory clauses in front. You you can you can really you can really use these building blocks to to build great very effective sentences and I always recommend I always recommend to my students that uh, you you vary your sentence patterns and types throughout your essay you wouldn't want to have the same type of sentence all the time it would it would make for choppy prose it would make for boring prose you really want to become a master of all these different patterns. All these different types of sentences and once you're able to see the the clauses the the building blocks the the uh, the raw material from which sentences are made then punctuation falls into place you begin to you begin to really oh commas go you really understand where and why to use punctuation marks